this working? We're good? Yeah. Great. Uh, it's a real pleasure to actually be uh, here and to have the opportunity to bring the message this morning. Uh, so most of you know me. There's a few people who don't. Uh, so my name's Peter Taylor. This is not what I do for a living. Uh, what I do for a living is I, I actually lecture uh, theoretical physics and math. So I'm a, a researcher in the area of theoretical physics. And despite the fact that I stand up pretty much every day in my life and give lectures to students, I'm unusually nervous this morning, so bear with me. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been here um, over the last number of weeks, we have been doing this series on Nehemiah. Um, so just to give you a very quick overview of the book for, for those who are joining us for the first time. So the Kingdom of Judah, and in particular Jerusalem, has been conquered by the Babylonians. The city has been laid waste, so the walls are down, the temple is destroyed, uh, the houses are, have been ransacked and pillaged, all of the nobles and all of the influencers and all of the people who knew anything about Israel's heritage have been taken off into captivity, and all, only the outcasts uh, have, have been left, the poor and the outcasts are left there in Jerusalem. And it was like that for quite some time. The Babylonians subsequently get conquered by the Persians, and the Persians are much more sympathetic to uh, Jerusalem's cause. So we pick up the story about 150 or so years after Babylon has been, or after Jerusalem has been leveled by the Babylonians. Um, there has been subsequent trips back to Jerusalem to try to rebuild and repopulate the city, but they haven't been particularly successful. And so we pick up the story around 150 years or so uh, with Nehemiah. And Nehemiah asks uh, a, a brother from Jerusalem, Hanani, what's going on in the city? He tells him that things are dreadful, it's, it's going awful, the people are dismayed, the walls are still down despite many attempts to rebuild them, um, and, and it's not good. The, the, the promise of restoration, the promise of the exiles going back and restoring the city hasn't actually panned out yet. And so that's where we pick up the story. Um, now, most of the applications of the book of Nehemiah uh, that we've seen over the last uh, number of weeks have actually been on a, on a corporate application, at least if you've been paying attention. So it's kind of been on, on unity, how we develop unity within the church, for example, how we, how we deal with things like offense, uh, building up, say, a vision for what we're actually building. So these are the things that we've been, been focusing on. Today I want to focus on something completely different. So today I want to focus on a personal application. And in particular, I want to focus on Nehemiah's paradigm for mental restoration. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about mental health. So in particular, I want to talk about how do you rebuild, how do you restore your health, your mind, um, your heart after a period of deep loss? after a period of trauma, or just general mental, mental health problems. Now, the book of Nehemiah has been very important to me over the last number of years. In fact, it's been quite a manual to me over the last number of years, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but for now, I just want to want to let you know what the broad overview of what we're talking about is. It should also be clear to everybody that this is an increasingly prevalent problem, that mental health is an incre increasingly prevalent problem in society. I'll give you just one statistic to illustrate this. The average secondary school student or high school student, uh, for those uh, not from Ireland, today has the anxiety levels of a psychiatric patient in the 1950s. This is a problem. Now, we as Christians should be able to book that trend, right? We, sh we should not be... We should not, statistics should not apply to us the way it applies to everybody else. We, we should have a means to book that trend. So I want to tell you a little bit today about, about some practical ways I think we can uh, look at Nehemiah and, and uh, develop a paradigm for uh, this restoration process. Um, before I get into the, the kind of practical stuff, uh, so I'm going to be using this phrase, renewing the mind a lot, so it's good to kind of, at least I'm a, I'm a mathematician, so I like to start with definitions. So it's good to think about what I really mean by renewing the mind. And in the Bible, the mind 
um, maybe has a slightly broader definition than, than the way we use it in everyday life. So the, the division between the mind and the soul and the heart in biblical writings is, a, is actually a thin veil. Uh, so so when, when the Bible talks about renewing the mind, uh, it means something much broader than your thought processes. It means something much broader than just your intellect. In fact, it means your emotions. It means uh, your will. It means the seed of your deepest convictions. In fact, in, in the Bible, your mind effectively is your soul and your heart. They're also connected. Uh, so when I talk about renewing the mind, I talk about something much broader. Can I actually get the... Great, thanks. Okay, so this will be my definition for renewing the mind. It's learning how to replicate the patterns and rhythms of God's heart. How he thinks, how he responds emotionally, because God responds emotionally, in case you didn't know that. He gets angry sometimes, you know, for example. He does respond emotionally. And how he makes decisions. So this, this is what I mean by renewing the mind. We have to learn how to replicate how God thinks, how he feels, how he makes decisions. That's what we mean by renewing the mind in this much broader context. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that this renewal process we now know is actually literal, not metaphorical. So for years and years and years and years, scientists believed that your brain was a fixed physical entity. In other words, that the neural pathways in your brain are fixed. But we now know they're not. Over the last few decades, we now know that actually you can strengthen and weaken physically the neural part pathways in your brain according to, say, for example, what you meditate on, according to experiences in your life. Your brain is actually malleable, and it actually transforms according to the experiences in your life, both conscious and unconscious. So this is an actual uh, literal transformation. And we've only come to realize this actually over the last few years. So let me give you one quick example of a very extreme case of this. This is from the, from the lobster. So this area of research, by the way, is called neuroplasticity. So that's, that's the term scientists use for the transformation of the mind, uh, the transformation of the neural pathways in the mind. So the lobster. So lobsters are very aggressive. They're very territorial. Uh, and it's actually really easy to, uh, to study their brains because they have these very large neurons that are, that are easy to observe. So we can actually observe what's happening in their brains quite easily. Uh, now, because these are very aggressive and territorial, they fight often, and sometimes they even fight to the death. But when a previously dominant lobster suffers a deep loss, it has an absolute catastrophic effect. Their brain practically dissolves and rebuilds and their new brain rebuilds and has been rewired for that lobster to be a loser, not a winner. Isn't that amazing? So, so catastrophic is this transformation that it even affects the posture of the lobster. The lobster now walks around slumped over, head down. The lobster produces less of the chemical serotonin, so it's less assertive, it's less happy, it's less confident, and what's more, the lobster retreats from battle. It loses its courage. It retreats from battle often, even against the lobster that it has previously defeated. Now, I know that sounds extreme, but maybe there's people in here that can relate that to that kind of catastrophic transformation. Maybe there's people in here that have gone through stuff that have been very traumatic, and they kind of feel like they haven't been the same person since. They kind of feel like maybe their brain has, has remapped the same way that the lobster's brain was. So I can definitely relate to this. So I've always been a pretty confident person, always been very outgoing, I've always been very positive, always been very optimistic. I'd say some people who met me a few years ago might even have said I flirted with the boundary of being overconfident. But a few years ago, uh, we had a, a deep loss in our family. Not a, not a death, but we had this great family environment, and pretty much out of the blue, as far as we were concerned, uh, my dad left the family. Okay, it was deeply traumatic for us. It had a profoundly negative effect on me, in particular, because I had a very good relationship with my dad. 
Uh, and like I said, it, it was quite out of the blue. And the effect that it had on me was really, really unexpected. I developed deep anxiety. I started having panic attacks, pretty much out of the blue as well, during the season. Uh, I started fearing going to bed because I could never sleep and I'd be wrestling with these thoughts. And it just had this really, really, really deeply negative impact on my life. My family members, Kit my wife, would, will tell you that I started becoming distant and disengaged even from her. And other family members will tell you that they went through similar transformations during this period. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, my brain had remapped. I had suffered this deep, deep, deep loss, and it had started to affect my patterns of thought. I started to become fearful. I started to become anxious. I started to fear social situations, and I was always very, 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 very sociable. Uh, in particular, I started fearing one-on-one -on -one social situations, and I would develop panic attacks if I knew that I had to go and meet somebody one-on-one, -on -one, which is a, it's, it's not a great situation to be in when you have to stand up in front of people and talk for a living. Um, so that, that's the lobster, uh, and that's my own personal journey. And so this is why I say that the book of Nehemiah has been very important to me. So around that time, uh, I really, really felt God, this was probably a couple of years ago, I really felt God was drawing me to the book of Nehemiah. And I knew the book was about restoring a wall, and so it seemed uh, quite obvious to me that, that God was, was saying something to me about uh, using this book as a manual for the restoration process. And so I started studying the book for, with real intent, in fact, and I've been studying it for, for quite some time now. So, so this is, for me, this is a message that's been brewing in me for a couple of years. So I'm, I'm dying to get it out in a certain sense. Uh, so I hope it's going to be useful for, for some of you uh, here as well. Um, okay, so what I really wanted to do is just give you four... Uh, Practical ways, I mean, I think they're practical ways in which Nehemiah restored the city. And how we can use these things as a paradigm for restoring our own mental health, especially when you've gone through uh, deep trauma or deep loss. Um, I mean, most of this is just plainly in the book. It hasn't been any great insight or anything on my part, I don't think. I, I literally, I'm just looking at the things that Nehemiah did that were very important to restoring the life of the city. Um, now, you probably can't see this text, so uh, uh, I'll read it out. But, but I want to say that the first thing that Nehemiah does, the very, very, very first thing that he does, is he lays hold of a scriptural promise. So he, Hananiah tells him how bad things are in the city, and he knows that he has to restore the city. He has a deep, deep burden for restoring the city. But the very, very first thing he does is he lays hold of a scriptural promise. So we're going to see, we're going to see what he says here. This is, this is his prayer. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place uh, which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. So what is now Maya doing here? He's reminding God of a promise. Now, why do we remind God? We see men and women in the Bible all the time reminding God of a promise. It's kind of a weird thing to do, right? Why would you remind God of a promise? It's clear that it's not because he has forgot. All right, that, that should be obvious to everybody. So what is the point? Well, to my mind, there's at least two reasons that you would remind God of a promise. Uh, the first reason goes back to this idea of uh, meditating on the word and how it actually affects your brain. Um, and that is, when you meditate on a word of God, when you meditate on God's truth, it actually transforms the neural pathways in your brain. And I don't mean this metaphorically, by the way. I mean this literally. This is a literal biological effect. Meditating on the truth of God will transform your brain. And we've only understood this in the last couple of decades, so this is, this is very recent research. So, so that is the first reason. In other words, let me put it to you another way. Medit you have two choices. You can either be build a super highway in your brain for God's truth, 
and have a little dirt track over on the side for lies, or you can build a super highway for lies and have only a little dirt track for God's truth. And I know which one I'd prefer. So that's the first reason why you should lay hold of a scriptural promise. But there's, an, there's another reason, and that is there's something really, really important about tapping into our inheritance, our heritage as Christians. In other words, we actually have a heritage in the testimony of other people. What is he doing here? He's tapping into, into the heritage of the Israelites. He's tapping into a promise that was actually given to Moses, not to him. Let me put it to you another way. Our heritage in the saints, in other words, our heritage in, in other people's testimonies and in the, in the stories that we read in the Bible, they're not just a lifeless history of their victories. What they actually are is a life-giving prophecy of our victory. That's, that's really important. So when we read the Word, when we read the testimony of others, whether it be in a book or whether it be in the Bible, we shouldn't just read them with the view that what's actually happening is we're just retelling a nice history about what God has done in the past. What, what that heritage does is it carries a prophetic grace to do in your life what was done in their lives. Because the word is alive, right? The word is active, right? So, so that heritage, those testimonies, actually carry a prophetic grace to repeat the miracle. So for those of you who are struggling, for example, today with your mental health, you get to take my testimony as a prophetic grace to do again in your life what God did in my life. If you're still unconvinced by this, by the way, let me tell you that the, the root word in Hebrew, the root word for testimony is the same as the root word to do again. The root word for testimony is the root word for to do again. So let me mention a couple of scriptures just in case you're still unconvinced. Psalm 119. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. So the testimonies of other people I have taken as my heritage forever, my inheritance. Revelations 12.11 states, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. In other words, the testimony carries the prophetic grace to actually achieve miracles. That's really important. This was important to me, and we see that, that this is the first thing that Nehemiah does. He lays hold of his heritage in the Israelites. He lays hold of a promise. He lays hold of the word. This is important. Okay, so the next thing that he does, and, and the next thing is really the focus of the book of Nehemiah, is he goes about restoring the integrity of the boundary wall. Okay, so he lays hold of, of a promise. So he, he has in his heart now that this is what he needs to do. He has been meditating on this promise, and then he goes back to Jerusalem, um, and he starts restoring the boundary wall. Now, there's something kind of interesting about this from my perspective, because as far as I'm concerned, this is the most unpentecostal miracle in all of the Bible. It is a miracle, Nehemiah cites it as a miracle. He, he says that, that their enemies were so disheartened because they knew that this was the work of God. They knew God had achieved this, right? And he restores in 52 days what the Jews living there couldn't do in 150 years. In 52 days, he does what they couldn't do in 150 years. But he had to get his hands dirty. God could have just rebuilt the wall, right? God could have just spoken it. Could have just done it. Just because it's grace and not works doesn't excuse you from work. You with, you with me? So he had, to get, he had to get dirt in his fingernails to do it. They worked day and night, but it's still a miracle. There's something interesting about that. So what does the wall represent? For us, as far as I'm concerned, the wall represents 
well, our defenses, obviously. But to be more specific, it represents our separation from external influences, from cultural influences, you might say. So Proverbs 4.23 gives us a great verse for this. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Above all else, why is it so important to guard your heart? Well, I would say it's even more important to guard your heart in a season of discouragement. When you've, if you're sitting here today and you've been through a, a real loss, a real trauma, you really need to guard your heart. Let's think about the words we use for this. Discouragement. You've lost your courage for the battle. That's what it really means, right? Demoralized. Demoralized. You lost your incentive to do what is moral or what is right. Disappointed. You appoint somebody for a purpose. You've lost your sense of purpose. In other words, this season of disappointment, discouragement, and demoralization can actually be a demonic opportunity for further destruction. Right? Because you're already, you're already uh, losing your courage for the battle. You're already, you know, your moral boundaries are a little bit shaky because you're demoralized. You're disappointed, so your, your sense of purpose is a little bit shaky. How important is it to guard your heart in that season? I love this verse, the Nehemiah 4.6. So we built a wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. So this is after a few weeks of building. For the people had a mind to work. This scripture was read out last week, but I think it was the NIV version. And it, 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 I think it was, a, in my view, it's a poor translation. In that version, they say, uh, the people worked with all their heart. This is saying something completely different. The people had a mind to work. It's a matter of having a will to do it. They set their mind to work. The language here reminds me of the language in Luke, where uh, Jesus is, knows he's about to head into Jerusalem to be betrayed and to be crucified. He knows this is about to happen. And the Bible says he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. Knowing what was ahead, he, in other words, it's not a matter of being determined or determination. It's a matter of predetermination. You have to decide today whether you're going to rebuild a wall. Amen. You can't wait till you're in the heat of the battle. You have to decide today. And the great news, the great news is everybody can decide today. All right? You have the ability to decide today. You have the will to decide today. And I just love this. They had a mind to work. I think that's just an amazing picture of, of the urgency we have to have when it comes to rebuilding and protecting our hearts. So on a more practical front, what am I really talking about here when I talk about rebuilding? I'm talking about what are we allowing ourselves to be discipled by? What are we watching? What are we listening to? What are we reading? Discipleship is not really a choice. You are being discipled whether you like it or not. But if you don't choose to be discipled by the word, then you will be discipled by culture. I mean, we even have a language around this, right? We talk about influencers. An influencer is just somebody who you let disciple you. It's just somebody who you choose to let have an influence over your life. That's discipleship. We, we talk about followers. How many followers have you got? I mean, if you're following somebody, you're basically giving them permission in some sense to influence and disciple you. So we, we really, really, really have to be very, very careful about what we're allowing in, about what we're watching on TV, about protecting 
the external influence on our hearts and on our souls. Let me put it to you another way. The height of your wall will actually determine the depth of your freedom. This is completely countercultural. In culture, freedom is the ability to do what you like. In God's kingdom, freedom is the power to do God's will. It's a big difference. And here's the real irony of it. The ability to do what you like, if pursued to its end, will inevitably lead to bondage where you won't be able to do what you like. Ask anybody who's ever struggled with an addiction. Their freedom to do what they like resulted in bondage and now they no longer have the power to do what they like. Everybody in addiction basically will tell you that they don't want to be in addiction anymore, but they've lost the power over the thing that's holding them in bondage. So it's really, really, really important that we understand that having a high wall will determine, in some sense, the depth of your freedom. In other words, you can't really have true spiritual freedom if you're being discipled by culture, if you're being discipled by everything out there. And I don't, I'm not talking about separation from the point of view of not mixing with people. Okay, well, I mean, we have to love people at the end of the day. I'm talking about what we're letting disciple us. This is an area in which, when I went through this, this period of deep anxiety, uh, in which I actually failed, I would say, because what tends to happen when you go through these periods of discouragement and disappointment, and anybody who's been through one, I, I know will relate to this, you, you get very tired from the battle. And what you, when you're really, really tired and really demoralized and really discouraged, you look for some form of escapism, naturally. Obviously, supernaturally, you, you push towards something else. But in your natural, you look towards something that will just give you an easy escape. And I just was so tired after a day's work and from dealing with all of these thoughts that I would just come in and flake out in front of the TV for a period of months. Kim will tell you I was completely disengaged. I would just flake out in front of the TV. In other words, I was being discipled by the television. And what I found happening over time is because I was being discipled by the television, that my boundary wall was getting weaker and weaker. And the things that I was willing to sit and watch was getting worse and worse, and increasingly bad for my soul. And God really had to deal with that. But you can, see that, you can see the negative feedback, right? If I'm in this position where I'm being discipled by the television and I'm, and I'm absorbing things that are increasingly bad for my soul, then that's going to lead to more bad decisions, which is going to lead to a weaker boundary wall, which is going to lead to more bondage, which is going to lead to me being powerless against it. There's a negative feedback mechanism here, which is why Nehemiah built the wall with such urgency. Do you know Ezra actually a few years ago had led an expedition and they rebuilt the temple a few years before Nehemiah? It didn't result in any renewal in the city. Isn't that weird? They rebuilt the temple. The heart of worship in the city. But it didn't renew the city. The city wasn't renewed because the wall wasn't rebuilt. Their neighboring city still had a huge influence on them. They were still being discipled by the culture around them, even though they rebuilt the temple. That's what Nehemiah really understood. He understood that you really needed to put the wall in place first. And this is the period where you're going to experience most opposition. I mean, we see it with Sambalat and Tobiah. We, we saw it last week as well. Sambalat says, will they revive the stones from the heaps? In other words, you're not going to rebuild the wall You've no chance. Why even start? Tobias says, oh, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, 
it'll fall over. In other words, even if you do rebuild something, the first sign of pressure, the wall's coming down. But I can tell you as somebody who's walked through it, you can and you will rebuild a wall. The third point I want to make, after you've rebuilt the wall, you have to remember that rebuilding the wall is not really the point. The point is to have a thriving city. But you can't have a thriving city without a good boundary wall, without good protection. Once you have the wall in place, this is what, this is what Nehemiah does. He reinstitutes the disciplines of communion. In other words, we see it here, then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed that I gave charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani. In other words, when the wall was built, he reappointed the Levites and he reappointed the singers and he reappointed actually Ezra to read the law in public. So he reinstitutes the basic disciplines of communion. So what are, as Christians, what are our basic disciplines of communion with God? The word, worship, and prayer, right? They haven't changed over millennia, guys. They're still the basic disciplines. No matter, I mean, we change how we frame them. We have technology. But these are the basic disciplines of communion with God, the basic disciplines of a healthy spiritual life. That's not going to change. That's an unchangeable thing. These are the basic disciplines. And, and again, I, I just love Nehemiah's wisdom. He really gets it. He gets that we have a wall in place now. The, the temple has been rebuilt by Ezra a few years earlier. So what do we do? We reappoint the Levites. We reappoint the singers. We start instituting worship again. He gets Ezra to bring out the book of the law and starts reading it in public again. He starts... He understands that, that this is really how we get the, th the city to thrive again. We now have our protection in place. Now let's start instituting the disciplines of commune, the face-to-face the -face relationship with God. These are the disciplines that Jesus talked about when he talked about remaining in me. They're essential. I'll give you uh, one other little uh, little quirky thing from science to illustrate this point. Some of you heard me mention this at, uh, at the conference re recently, but not everybody was there, so it's re worth repeating. So if you sit opposite somebody, this is a science experiment that people have done, and you stare intently into their eyes for a sustained period without contact, you just sit two chairs opposite, opposite each other, and you stare intently into each other, for a sustained period, your heartbeats start to align. I don't, and I don't just mean that your hearts start to beat at, at the same rate. Your cardiographs actually start to align. In other words, him whose eyes you're fixed on, intently on, your heart will start to beat in sync with. Amen. So if you institute these disciplines of communion, getting into the word which washes over the brain and, and uh, starts to build those neural pathways in your brain for God's truth. You start to get into the presence of God and worship him. And you start to cry out to him in prayer. You start to cultivate that face-to-face -face relationship with, with him. Your heart will start to beat in sync with his. This is what we actually mean by renewing the mind. Right? This is renewing the mind. It's not about intellect or thought processes in that sense. It's about aligning your heart and your mind with his. And you do that by these basic disciplines. Um, for me, it was the, it was the drive into work, actually, where, where I really started to, to institute this. Um, I had an hour, I, I have a long commute to work, so I have an hour in and an hour out. And for those two hours a day, instead of listening to the radio, I just de I determined that I'm just I'm going to worship God for those two hours a day. It had such a transformative effect on me. I, I couldn't I couldn't explain to you how transformative it was. I mean, the M50 became my altar. It was it really had a a profound effect on me. I mean, God really started doing deep works in me in the car. And I, 
just felt for whoever was driving beside me, thinking that guy's having a nervous breakdown in the car next to me. But, but it was really transformative for me. So if you can carve out, you need to carve out time in your day for these basic disciplines. It's so, so, so important. And the last point that I wanted to mention yeah, is this. So Nehemiah has restored the city. He goes back to the, to the king of Persia and the revival is short-lived. And the revival is short-lived because the high priest Eliashib had made an agreement with Tobiah. Tobiah the Ammonite. Tobiah the guy who was threatening Nehemiah. And Tobiah is living in the temple. He's not even a Jew. He's not a priest. He's not a Levite. He's no place in the temple. It's illegal for him to be in the temple. He put them in the storeroom where the tithes were meant to be stored for the Levites. So the Levites become frustrated because they're no longer getting their tithes and they just go back, and they'll go back to their day jobs. In other words, the worship stops. The people have stopped serving. And here's my point. So remember, this is an agreement that Eliashib has made with Tobiah. And the agreements made in those seasons of discouragement, if left unbroken, will always compromise your communion with God, will always compromise your worship. The worship stopped because of this agreement that Eliashib made with Tobiah. It's really, really important if you've made agreements in those seasons of discouragement to break them. And let me just quickly say, the two common agreements, the two common lies that people make in seasons of discouragement can be broadly categorized in two different ways. One, God is not good enough. Two, I'm not good enough. They're the two common agreements that almost everybody makes in a season of discouragement. And the answer to both of them is the same. The cross. In the cross, you see that God is good enough. He gave his only son for you. Jesus died for you. God is good enough. The other one, I'm not good enough. Hmm, how do we deal with that? Same answer, the cross. In the cross, that is the value that God places on your life. Jesus says, you are worth the cross. You are worth every lash. You are worth every strike in my face. You are worth every spit of scorn on my body. You are worth every nail pierced through my hands. Every drop of blood. That's the value that God puts on your life. You are good enough. I'm going to finish with this. There's this amazing scene in Nehemiah where they consecrate the wall. And Nehemiah gets two giant choirs to get up on top of the wall, the wall that Tobiah said would break down if a fox went up on it. They get two giant massive choirs of hundreds, probably thousands of people all along the wall, and they start worshiping God. This amazing cry of worship. And the Bible says that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. I can tell you honestly, and I'm not saying it because I'm standing on the stage, that's my testimony this morning that I went through an amazing season of, the amazingly difficult season of anxiety. But I know a joy today that I haven't known in years and years and years and years. I know a family life today that I haven't enjoyed in years and years and years. And the external circumstances haven't changed, by the way. They're still, they're still as tumultuous as, as ever. But in my own family, life is brewing again. I'm telling you that things are good. Spiritually, things have never been better. And I've, I've known a peace and a joy that I haven't known in a very, very, very long time. Uh, so maybe if you just stand with me and I'll, and I'll close things out. Maybe I'll just close with some prayer. Uh, Father, I, uh, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, that 
even though you don't promise that we won't go through difficult seasons, you do promise that you're faithful. You do promise that you have an answer to bring us out of the valley. And Lord, I pray over every person here who has gone through a deep loss or deep trauma and has that sense, that internal sense that they haven't been the same since. Lord, that you would minister to them, to them this morning. Lord, that they would, they would know that you are the way out of this season. They would know, Lord, that when they look at the cross, that you are good enough. And they would know, O oh God, not to sit under the weight of shame and under the lies that they are not good enough. And Lord, I just pray that their testimony would be like my testimony and their joy would be heard afar off, that their joy would reverberate through their families, through their friends, through their neighbors, and that what you do with them in this season would just be an amazing testimony that would have a far, far, far reach. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. That was excellent, wasn't it? It's really, really good. So guys, we have a prayer team to my right for anyone who wants prayer, and I'm sure that has touched on nerves, hearts, minds today. So please, there's a prayer team to my right. There's a welcome team to my left up in the balcony for anyone that's their first time in the church. We'd love to introduce you to some of the team, give you some nice tea, coffee, make you feel at home, and just learn more about the church. That's upstairs to my left. And uh, there's Bibles here because we need to get renewing our minds. Amen. Uh, and so if you don't have a Bible, they're just free. Just come and take one and enjoy the Word of God. Have an amazing week. Those in cars, I know you're going to have fellowship now and a great tea and coffee. Just be mindful, it's nearly half 11 and we're wanting to change the car park in for the next service coming in. So just to be mindful with that as well. But have a great week. We love you. The Lord bless you guys.